This ain't no party. This ain't no disco. That means it can only be one other thing. It's the Stick to Wrestling Podcast. My name is John McAdam, and I am here with an absolutely great guest. But I want to wel- welcome everyone to the f- first show of the second season of Stick to Wrestling. Somehow the powers that be at Arcadian Vanguard are letting us do this again. Wow. Sean, before we start, I want to introduce my guest, uh, my guest, my co-host, my convivial co-host, Sean Goodwin. Sean, the, the side, you got to tell us about our, our companion piece. Our companion piece, of course, is the, I, I believe that's turned into a drinking game now, every time I say companion piece. <laughs> Um, our companion piece, the web, uh, the, the Facebook page, which we have a, a big crowd over there, all great guys. There's never an argument. There, it, we have just not old had school wrestling. One jive turkey episode. No nope. one. No. Nope. No. Nope. It's been a year. We haven't had a single problem. We have cool videos, and, and just to let you know. I posted a couple videos today. One is a 1978 episode of Houston Wrestling. And two is a movie, TV movie from the 70s that involves wrestling called Blood and Guts from 1978 <laughs> that I have never heard of before in my entire life. And it yeah, looks epically horrible. But you get all that and good conversation, old school wrestling fun over at the Stick to Wrestling Facebook page. Now, let me ask you this. Does it, not, does it sound like companion piece? It sounds like something not so – about a girl to your friends when she's not around. Eh, don't worry about her. She's not going to be around in a couple of months. My companion piece. It's not like that. It's really good. No, it enhances, so, it enhances oh, the experience. There you go. Now, before I bring on my guest, who is a legend, if you enjoy this show, we don't have ads. We don't charge for the show. We ask that you give us a contribution to Pro Wrestling Archives at gmail.com by way of PayPal. We serve up a tasty podcast, and we're just asking for a tip. No big deal. My legend, a man legend he goes by the name tamale on all of the message boards but he's really my good pal max levy who i once went to a red sox game with max how are you hey i'm doing good i'm doing good max levy i should uh uh correct you right uh, right right away oh no don't even worry about it like the rest of our our family are are levy's and then just uh my dad for some reason because he had to be different uh took the the levy spelling so that's how we uh how we roll and I'm, i'm really glad to be on the show, love that uh, Red Sox game. I am actually, no joke, I, I can send photographic proof later, I am wearing a Red Sox t-shirt in honor of John and Sean tonight. I wanted to get a little bit in on the Massachusetts flavor. I am honored. Flavor. So I, I'm thinking the Levy thing has to do with Don McClain, but let's get on with this party. We have a bunch of different things we're going to talk about. The first thing I want to talk is the WWE. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this, kids. The WWE Super Show that took place uh, a week from when this show will be airing, uh, which will be Friday, June the 14th. What are you guys' thoughts, first of all, on the show itself? Max, why don't we start with guest? Well, you know, I, I've got to say that the show looked so uninspiring uh, going in and was going to be so long and at such an inconvenient, in, in, inconvenient time that – uh, I didn't even really, uh, to be honest, watch it. Uh, I was kind of under the impression, just based on the way they promoted it and the way I perceived the first couple Saudi Arabia shows, that you know this is like a big special event for the people in Saudi Arabia. It's good business for the WWE, maybe not in reputation, but certainly in money to go over there. But that nothing that happens on this show really counts as far as the storylines go. And then I heard about uh, Goldberg versus Undertaker, and that part uh, I, I did watch, and that's all of the the show that I've seen, and probably all that I, I think I need to. <laughs> I'm inclined to agree with you, John. I know you have some. I know Sean has some strong opinions of this baby. Uh, okay, that was the worst. That Goldberg Undertaker match was the worst match I have seen with name nationally known name wrestlers since the Jake Roberts Legend of Wrestling match. Neither one of those two should ever be in a ring. You know what the best part is? The Undertaker doesn't have to wear makeup anymore. <laughs> he just naturally oh, looks. Yeah, like his, have to. his face looks like it's melted. He looks old. Okay, so that problem one. 
is that they both look like, you know, Goldberg looks fine, I guess. I mean, they're both in pretty good shape. I'll give him that. I, I do have a question, though. At the beginning, when Goldberg did that bit through the, uh, the, the turnbuckles, did he hit the post? I'm thinking that cut was hard way. I, I think it was hard way, too. He hit it hard, and he seemed yeah. to be kind of out of it after that. Yeah. I mean, because he tried to put a leg, uh, uh, some kind of a leg lock on Undertaker, and Undertaker literally had to put it on for him. It was like watching one of those old Flair Kerry Von Eric matches. <laughs> where you know Rick is putting the move on for Kerry, uh, and then then they nearly broke each other. I, the only reason we can laugh about this now is because they thankfully didn't break their necks, and this could have happened to either one of them on three separate occasions. Um, they botched a, a tombstone. How does he botch a tombstone? How many times has he rolled he's, that move? Because he's old. I know, but still, I mean, you'd think you'd have that one by like an autopilot by now. Um, uh, Gold, I can I can more I think, understand. I think Goldberg, Goldberg was dead waiting him at that point because he was so out of it. Maybe, maybe. And then Goldberg had the, uh, you know, just that almost – look, if he's that weird, why are they even going for the jackhammer there? I mean that nearly ended it up badly. And then that, that, that was finally, a, That was a shoot brain buster. Yeah. Yeah, it ended up – and finally you had the um, – what was the, uh, the, the, the final match where the, – the final move where they, uh, Goldberg went for the tombstone and they both just kind of fell on top of each other. And then, then – if of course, you have Undertaker with that look that just tells you all you need to know about that match. Have you seen the picture yet of uh, yeah. his look? Uh, yeah, I perfect. saw it, yes. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, here's here's my take on it. I mean, first of all, it, it, you know, like Sean said, we all knew, we all know now that everyone came out okay, but Undertaker dropped Goldberg straight on his head like a dart going, like a dart going straight down. And my understanding was Goldberg was either knocked out or just knocked woozy and you can't blame the guy. And, and the match just deteriorated from there. Um, you know, the undertaker is 54 years old. He's older than me for God's sake. So the first time <laughs> I said he looks old was 2001 or 2002. And that was a long time ago. Goldberg is 52. He looked old 15 years ago. And you know, it, Here's, here's what bothers me. When they have WrestleMania, when they have these shows, especially WrestleMania, this bothers me when they do this. It's like the stars come out. You know, the stars, like 49-year-old Shane mm -hmm. McMahon, who pinned Roman Reigns on this show. How about Nashua's own Triple H? He turns 50 next month. He put over Randy Orton, who turns 40 next year. Tri you know, Triple H, here's the thing. The, the guys who were on Monday night or Tuesday night, Roman Reigns, Seth Rollins, etc., they're never going to get over if you're portraying Triple H, Shane McMahon, The Undertaker, Bill Goldberg, etc. as the tough guys who are the real stars in the main event. You're never going to get those guys over. I agree. I agree. And, and Taker, had, he just doesn't have it anymore. He needs to stop. Uh, you know, I think Goldberg could probably still do uh, you know, an acceptable match if he wasn't knocked loopy, but you know, Taker had the great opportunity when he, you know, set the coat and the and the gloves and the hat in the ring a few years ago to walk away, and they just keep bringing him back again and again. And you know, he's becoming like one of those guys, you know, years ago who was you know a big WWF star in you know the '80s, who by the '90s had nothing left and practically had to be dragged away, like you know, kind of like how Savage was at the very end of WCW. Somewhere yeah. back, I mean, it. it... No, Sean, go ahead. Somewhere Backlund's working the step test right now. <laughs> it, it I think be. I think this main event more says it says more about what they think of this event. Uh, but they do it at WrestleMania, and I mean, if I can make a comparison, it would be like if in the first WrestleMania you gave really important roles to Bruno Sammartino, Victor Rivera, Bobo Brazil, and Gorilla Monsoon, because those guys in '85 were about as old as these guys are now. And they're about, mm -hmm. and they're in the past. Undertaker's prime was twenty years ago. The whole uh, attitude era was twenty years ago. It's time to walk away from that. They, um, as this comes out June fourteenth, and this show comes out. This, if Buzz Sawyer had not OD'd, he would be sixty years old today. Gosh, Max, any thoughts on that? It, you know, it's hard to uh, imagine him only being 60 now because when he died and the 
bit in uh, PWI said that he was 32. I was sure that that was a misprint. I mean, I just could not believe that he was only 32 when he died. He looked bad. He looked like a guy who, you know, the road had uh, taken everything out of him and, and whatever it left, he, he finished off. And, but he really was, uh, uh, that, that young when he died, it's hard to, hard to believe. I mean, I can't imagine what kind of life he would have now if he was still alive, if he kept oh, on the God. way he was going. Oh, yeah. Uh, Sean, any Buzz Sawyer thoughts? Nobody, aged, even Tommy Rich, nobody aged more in two years than Buzz Sawyer did. If you take a picture of him from 1981 and then take another picture of him from 1983, it's like dog years. It was like, it's like a oh, yeah. 14 year difference. It's incredible. It's a different guy. So, I mean, it's as, as Max said, 60, that's it. He looked like he was 60 last time I saw him. I mean, it was I, – I, it is shot. I remember when you, – you sent me a bunch of 1981 Georgia film uh, taste, mm-hmm. uh, discs, and the most shocking thing of this when I saw it was watching Buzz Sawyer the first time. He, he had a little bit of hair. He was blonde, clean-shaven, good-looking guy. You know, I mean just you know, a good-looking baby face, kind of tough guy. And I'm like, wow, that's not even the same guy. Yeah, I mean, think about this. I'm sure I'm I'm sure you guys have both seen the uh, WCW match. So he's 30 years old when this is taking place. This is 1990. Um, I think it was the dumb RoboCop pay per view. Buzz jumps off the top rope and breaks his wrist. Um, and I remember seeing it live, like the first time it happened. I'm like, oh my god, he looks like you know, seeing it in full speed. I'm I'm like, wow, he just messed up his wrist bad. And then they showed the replay of it in slow-mo, and it was absolutely horrifying. It was a badly broken wrist. And that was the less significant thing that Buzz Sawyer did in wrestling. He was just doing independence after that, and he died soon thereafter. He was only 30 when that ha- happened. Yeah, he wound up moving out to Sacramento and opening a wrestling school, and I've never figured out how he wound up there. Maybe there was a girlfriend, but you know, I don't know of him having any connection to that town at all. I always thought that was odd. But what that also means is when he got that huge push in Georgia in 1983, he was only 23 years old, and he was the world's oldest 23-year-old. Uh, we had an expression when it came to steroids about a guy going nuclear, he went beyond nuclear. I mean, he he had that that look, that Michelin man look, like he was about to explode, and all his hair fell out, and he was crazy to begin with. I, I personally, Buzz Sawyer, and like that, when he got that huge push in 82, 83, I think he might have been the most over-pushed wrestler of all time who was not re- related to the promoter. What do you, Max, what do you think? I can go with that. I mean, especially by 83, I think it was a case where Georgia did not have a whole lot going for it. I mean, this is, you know, at the point when, you know, guys like killer Tim Brooks are are getting big pushes and, you know, Pez Watley getting, you know, a heavy baby face push. And, you know, they had something working with rich and buzz. And I think they just decided to keep going with it for lack of any other better ideas and lack of any other big name talent. Uh, But yeah, I mean, it was probably a little bit too much too fast, both, you know, in terms of what he could do wrestling wise and also probably for him as a person as well. Sean, let me hand the baton to you. What do you think? Uh, just to, to kind of set this up a little bit, I had seen Buzz a lot in the magazines, but I had never seen him until, because I didn't get cable until 84, and I didn't see the, uh, the first time I saw him was on the JCP show in April of 85, and I couldn't figure out what the big deal was. Um, but as far as him deserving the put, I think uh, 1981 Buzz Sawyer was very good. He's like kind of like Tommy Rich. He was. You see him later on, and you're like, what's, what's the big deal? Then you look at Tommy Rich in 81, you're like, oh, this is the big deal. Same thing with Buzz. He definitely had it if he didn't self-destruct. I, and I'm still – I am amazed at how much he aged in two years. I, it is shocking to see. Him. What the hell yeah. did he do in two years to look like that? Uh, he probably you- – Name it. I mean, I remember he was a really good worker. I'll give him that. When he was in world class, he and Matt Bourne, and this was in 86, were like the only guys who could do anything. Look at him in 86, and I'm someone who 
you know, can't blame Dave Melter or the dirt sheets for this because I watched George Sleet wrong here. It's an 18 year old watching wrestling, and I knew that things didn't make sense and something was something was askew, if you would. I mean, I think about Buzz Sawyer. I looked at him back then. I'm like, if he went to the WWF, how how would they push him? One Dunnigan back in New York, or would he be like an Iron Mike Sharp kind of guy? I mean, I can't see him, couldn't see him being a big star in the Carolinas, and he wasn't. Um, just no. And all in by Ole Anderson, you could tell the whole 1983 to build him up and flip him into a bit that out by spring summer. And who's going to be their top baby face star, which I kind of think is ridiculous. I don't know what you guys think. Yeah, he's he's so uh, such a natural lunatic. He's better off as a uh, better off as a heel. Uh, I'm actually holding something right here. This is from the St. Petersburg Times, October 6, 1977. The rise and fall of a wrestling star is the headline. And it's about a young man with a full head of hair named Bruce Wyan, uh, who had actually made it to the state tournament as a sophomore, but committed some sort of disciplinary infraction and got kicked off the team. And then he made it to the state semifinals in his weight class as a junior, but ahead of his senior year, he actually dropped out of high school because it was his goal to become a professional wrestler. And uh, he was working out with Bob Roop a little bit before Roop went to book San Francisco. Uh, but he was still uh, you know, going to the Sportatorium in Tampa, uh, going to the, uh, the Homer Hesterly Ar- Armory to see the shows. And this was the future Buzz Sawyer. So even when he was in high school uh, and just out of it, he was making it very clear that uh, his only goal in life was to be a pro wrestler. And they said that he was about 205 at that point, and all he was doing pretty much was uh, lifting weights when he wasn't training to become a wrestler. Wow, I mean, you, I mean, to 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 make the tournament as a sophomore is pretty impressive, and it's even more impressive when, when you're that good to get kicked off the team. The guys like that in he, the seventies, yeah, he had to do something bad. Yeah, I, I figured that it was probably you know caught with drugs or something because I don't imagine any old school seventies wrestling coach was going for that because pretty much anything else you think is going to get looked the other way. And you know, the article talks about how you know, everybody figured he was a shoe in to get an NCAA wrestling scholarship, but buzz himself in the article makes it pretty clear that he was not much of a student and didn't have interest in being one. And, you know, he dropped out of school and he said the only way he'd go back is if all he could do is wrestle and not have to go to school. I'm surprised they didn't accommodate him. That was the way it was like back then. Yeah. It's hard uh, to believe. <laughs> Sean, any, any, Really, Sean, any parting thoughts on Buzz Sawyer before we move on? Uh, not necessarily on Buzz, but on Georgia in that era. era. They, uh, what other territory outside of Dallas in the early 80s or mid-80s chewed up their young? I, I'm not just saying it's their fault, but look at how many – like the young guys who went into Georgia in the early 80s, like 79, 80, 81, and what they all look like four to five years later. Mm-hmm. I mean my God. Uh, Martell might just, be one exception, but yeah. I mean, it's uh, for some reason they don't get the bad rap that you know Dallas does. But I mean, what was going on there must have been every bit as bad. Yeah, I think the trade-off is nobody died on the on the scene. You know, Buzz died, but he was long gone from Georgia by then. But you know, yeah, I mean, Gordy's gone, uh, Buzz is gone. You know, and some of the guys that are left. I mean, my God, Michael Hayes. I mean, I love him, but he looks so old. We're we're going to talk a little bit about that next. Um, yeah, 30 years today, 30 years ago today, when the podcast dropped was J- June 14th, 1989, and there was a free Clash of the Champions special that aired on TBS. Now, let me ask you guys this. First of all, did you did you each watch it live? I watched it live. Yes. A Clash Sean? of the Champions. I, mu- I must have. If it was a live okay. Clash, of the- I watched all the look at clashes. All right. This was like the the peak of my NWA fandom, and I, I know I went out of my way to watch it live. And one of the things that was a teaser coming in, uh, Michael Hayes had turned heel, I want to say, in January. Uh, Terry Gordy came back in May and interfered, and Michael Hayes won the U.S. title. Um, I thought we were going to have a, a like a 
long title reign for Michael Hayes. And I think his feet fit, filled the shoes. I thought he was that good and turned around that it lasted about three weeks. Um, I don't know if they had any kind of a booking change go- going off. They had planned on him having a long reign or if they planned on having it be three weeks. But I thought they dropped the ball on that. But the whole time they were talking about, OK, who's going to be the new Freebird? And the reveal was done very early in this show that it was Jimmy Garvin. Max, let me ask you first. Coming in, did you know it was going to be Jimmy Garvin? Uh, I didn't know it was Jimmy Garvin, but I had actually guessed that it would be Garvin because you know he wasn't anywhere else and he hadn't been around in a while. And you know he was the guy who was the so-called fourth free bird who I would have imagined would be the good fit. And to be honest... You know, I once he actually got into the team, he never seemed like as good of a fit as when he was just gorgeous Jimmy tagging along with them. I agree with you. Sean, how about your thoughts? Did you know that it was going to be I knew it was going to be Jimmy Garvin, I had been told. But I mean, did you know or did you guess? Uh, no, because I didn't think they would be that dumb to do something that obvious. But I was wrong. Uh, Max <laughs> is absolutely correct, by the way. He was much better. Just as a sideline. I mean, how could it? That's the obvious guy. It's been he's been with them on and off for six years now. Mm-hmm. He's always kind of been connected to them in some way. And the the worst part was Jim Ross's shock when he came out. Shut mm-hmm. up, Jim. Really? I mean, come <laughs> on. He's he, he's been they've been together for seven whatever it is back in the early eighties back in Dallas. And you know, I, I did I thought they would have had the way they built it up. If memory serves, they were trying to make it like a big surprise. It ended up being why did he? Why did he have to have another partner anyway? Okay, well, I, I can get into that. Like, for I thought, here's the thing. I thought that it was not a surprise, but it was logical. Um, Buddy Roberts, in 1988, world class wouldn't even let Buddy Roberts wrestle full time. So he's going to work for a national promotion now, and that, that's just not going to happen. I was fine with that at first because I thought it was going to be, okay, the Freebirds get, are getting a big push. It's going to be Hayes and Garvin. Garvin are replacing Buddy Roberts, which I thought was fine. Buddy, you know, it was time for Buddy to go home. But as it turned out, Terry Gordy would be gone by August, and the Freebirds were no longer a faction as they had been for so many years. They were now just a tag team of Michael Hayes and Jimmy Garvin, and they were just another tag team. And it, I've said this on the show before. I apologize for repeating, but it seemed like as soon as that happened, Michael Hayes had lazy, but more importantly than that, he got so lazy on his interviews. He would say the same crap over and over again, looking into the camera, telling Lex Luger that he's like seven up. He never had it. And he, he never will. That's not a good interview. And Michael Hayes, the younger Michael Hayes, is one of the best interviews of all time. Max, any thoughts? It was a real weird time for him in WCW. I mean, he was really, you know, put over this image as one of the coolest guys walking, you know, for so many years. And then you could, I mean, it had already started in world class in 88, but as 89 went on, you could just see the cool dripping out of Michael bit by bit. And I think it was pretty much gone by the time Terry took off and the team was, you know, pretty much, you know, I think they still had the world tag belts, but they were pretty much relegated to mid carters and, you know, he just didn't seem very inspired. And it, like you said, it showed with the interviews, it showed with the work, you know, he and Garvin were you know, basically a couple of clown heels and it, it didn't really work for who he'd been. And, uh, you know, they were capable of doing a lot more if they would just let them. Yeah. I mean, it felt like, you know, I'm just guessing here, but Michael Hayes might have thought he was getting a long run with the United States title and a big singles push. When that got pulled from him, he just kind of mentally checked out. Uh, any other thoughts on Michael Hayes, Sean? Uh, two. One, did WCW uh, – did anyone ever go to WCW and work harder? It always seems to be the opposite, which is the entire problem with the WCW program. What they did was they basically got a bunch of uh, athletes who got their big-time con- – Contract and now could kick back. It was like you know the like the, the Yankees back in the early '80s. They had all a bunch of these talented guys who weren't doing anything. That was WCW because they couldn't develop their own guys. As far as um, uh, Hayes goes, uh, Michael Hayes goes here. The the issue, well, the bigger issue with using Garvin here is the role. That role was Buddy Roberts, and that was he was the guy who kind of was the structure. He held their matches together. Jimmy couldn't do that. Jimmy was mm-hmm. just basically no. a lesser version of Michael. 
So you needed somebody in there to kind of keep the whole operation together, like an Ivan with the Russians in that kind of a role. And Jimmy's not going to do that. That's the thing. Like, I honestly can't think of anyone who would have been a, a better fit than Jim Garvin. Like, I, I went over, like, you know, the roster of guys, maybe this guy, and that dude just is not that. Maybe that's a lack of creativity on, on my end. Max, any thoughts about maybe who? I, I really don't know. You know, I've thought, free bird. you know, who could have been another free bird. And, um, you know, I, I don't know who you know, would have been a, a better fit as a personality than Garvin. But, um, you know, he didn't work as well as he could or should have. Uh, but I don't know who could have taken his place. And just as a sidebar on, on Michael Hayes, you know, him changing his hair, I, I realized based on the looks of it during this card, I think he was starting to lose it. But, uh, you know, he, that was not a, a good look for him, and it, it helped t- take the cool factor down uh, just a little bit more. That new theme song didn't yeah. help either. No, I think they actually, that might have been a dub. I couldn't tell, but whatever it was, it's, it was no good. Right, but they were using a new song by that point, I think. Michael were they? Oh, okay, got it. The, Michael sang this new song, and it was absolutely awful. This was like 91, 92 when, oh, they, when okay. they started doing that. Oh, yeah. That was absolutely up. awful. I mean, last thought for me on Michael Hayes during this era, he was feuding with Lex Luger. And he would look in the camera and he'd say, you know, Lex Luger, I'm 29 years old or 29 years old. The difference is I've been wrestling for 10 years. You've been wrestling for three. And just, I mean, everyone in my living room was like, oh, Oh my God, that's the world's oldest 90, 29 year old. <laughs> Buzz Sawyer first, then we get into these. One thing I want to, when I watched the show for the first time uh, in a long time last week, I mean, was, can, has there been a crazier United States or show for, in the United States than the crowd was that night? Max, have you? Can you think of one, one that's even close? No, no, they were into everything. The only thing that happened though was that that you know they mentioned it a few times that it was like close to a hundred degrees in the arena, and by the time they got to the end of the show with the tournament final, it looked like at least half the crowd had cleared out, and the people that were left were just drained. And you know the finish of the show did not get the you know the crowd heat and and the pops that it should have. But early on, those people were going nuts for everything. It was, I mean, it was held at a military. Terry base. Um, and you're right. There was, it was in South Carolina, no, North Carolina. And it was in June. So it's hot down there and there's no air conditioning in the building. Jim Ron was soaked by the end of the night. Tommy Young looked like someone literally just thrown him in the pool because his, his shirt was dripping sweat. I, I took some notes here. Joe, it reminded me of the old Boston garden in late well, 70s but when i went in the early 80s i mean everyone is loud they're standing up they're throwing stuff in the ring there's no air conditioning almost 100 percent male there's like a pillar of cigarette smoke going up over the lights it's pouring off of everyone and everyone's like reaching over the rail trying to grab the wrestlers and most importantly lots and lots of beer was being sold and consumed i i that was this crowd was beyond rowdy any thoughts on the crowd? Yeah, well, it's. I thought they were um, – it started off – yeah, it starting off, they were very hot. And then they started off with three terrible matches in a row that killed that – you know, not dead, but I mean by the end of that card, they were mad. I mean by the time we got to Norman the Lunatic, they were, you were getting a little bit of hostility. <laughs> I mean why, why are you starting – why are we starting with the fabulous Freebirds against the dynamic flipping dudes? I mean, I basically hate everybody in this match. The the reason they started with that, and that's a good question, is they had two tag team matches first, and the two winners were going to meet towards the end of the show uh, for the final match for the NWA tag team title. So kicking off with that match actually did make a little bit of sense, even though aesthetically it looked a little bit off. But if you have a military audience, why you roll? I, it just seems odd to roll out the dynamic dudes with their little frisbees and uh, you know, and and Shane pointing at everybody like, yeah, uh-huh. I see you, man. Shut up! Oh God, I hated this match. I'm like, I'm like watching them awesome. come to the ring. I'm like, I'm gonna hate this so bad. 
<laughs> yeah, they they wanted something with they Shane and, and Johnny like the rock and rolls, but they just they didn't have it in them to pull it off in the ring. And the gimmick was just stillborn from the beginning. Oh. No, everyone hated that gimmick. I mean, suppose. This was a Jim Hurd thing where he did whatever research he did, and in California or wherever on the beaches, like the words were dude and dynamic, and that's where he came up with it. I mean, it's you know, and once again, it's like I say this a lot about WCW. I mean, we talk about like Ricky Steamboat not getting over, especially in the Northeast. I mean, don't I think one in WCW who was made these decisions should have actually gone to an actual wrestling show just like joe wrestling show night at the omni it's not going to kill you and get an idea of who is watching this what your audience is of course that's not the mm-hmm. wa- audience they wanted so i might have answered my own question they book for TV, i don't know but TV, they book for they book for tv ratings and not for crowds which can't work i mean you gotta uh, have you gotta I, I mean, you gotta draw. To do both yeah, yeah. They, I mean, they tried, tried to do both, and I think they might not have realized it. I kind of think this. I think by 1989, someone should have sat down and said, look, maybe the days of us being a national touring company are over. Maybe we shouldn't be out in Des Moines, Iowa on Tuesday night in front of 800 people. It makes more sense just to stay home and say, hey, you know, we're on the road Friday through Sunday, we do TV in the middle of the week, and that's it. Max, any thoughts on that? You know, it's all, actually what you said is a lot about how Eric Bischoff uh, started changing the company in the back half of '93 and into '94. They basically uh, stopped touring, except for you know places closer to home where they thought they at least had a prayer of drawing. Uh, I agree, there was no reason for them to be doing you know these West Coast tours or you know going off to these far flung places where nobody cared. I think. A lot of that was motivated by the idea that you know they needed to look like a national company in order to get national advertisers and get some of the national merchandising deals. But it, when you go out and you play in front of crowds of nothing, it just makes you look even more bush league. And you know the thing about a fan is you know the fan wants to be where things are exciting, where things are happening. If you go to a WWF show and there are ten thousand people there, fifteen thousand, whatever, you feel like you know this is something special. I'm a part of something. This is exciting. You go to a WCW show and it's a you know you know, 12,000 seat building and there's a thousand people there, you'll think, man, this is lame. I'm, I'm not going next time they come to town. If they come to town, I, I think that would have been a great way to go. I agree with you. And there's another part of it too. Like I went to a random WCW show at the Worcester Centrum in 1982. It was the night of that great uh, Duke and Kentucky game where Christian Leitner bagged the shot at the last minute. So not only did I miss that, I went to a bad WCW show in order to miss that. But the only reason I went is because I hadn't seen a WCW show in a long time. They hadn't been out in, in maybe that was the better way to push the company. Like, look, you know, we're in Los Angeles. We're going to be here once this year. If you miss this show, we'll see you next year. And maybe that would have been a better way to get people out. Um, not sticking to wrestling for a moment. Like one reason I think that the Ramones didn't do particularly well on the road. And by the way, that what I just said was accurate is because if you if I missed a Ramon show at you know, a casino or whatever, I'd be back in six months. Uh, Sean, any thought on, on like how that pertains to wrestling? I'm amazed that nobody in Turner's office. Well, how that? I mean, it's you guys are right, but I'm amazed that nobody in Turner's office actually sat somebody down and just said, "You guys don't really know what you're doing, do you?" I mean, you're pretending you know what you're doing, but you clearly don't know what you're doing. I I see the Mm -hmm. ding dongs. How can you look at the ding dongs and go, "Okay, this is a professional operation"? Yeah, it it probably looked great on paper. On on my list. I, you know, one big problem WCW had, I had always had this problem, was, was they never really figured out what they wanted to be. Like, I think they should have used product differentiation differentiation in their war instead of trying to be more like the WWF because you're not going to out-WWF 
WWF Vince McMahon. And in, another thing, they could if they had cut back on the maybe they could have said to the right wrestler, hey, you know, yeah, we do a little bit less than the WWF, but you're you know you're not on the road uh, six weeks in a row like some of those guys were. You know, you get to you go out and work the weekend, come home, spend time with your family. I think that could have worked in some cases. Move on to the ding dongs. One quick thing about the uh, the the second match, which you were wise to skip it. Um, Ranger Ross versus the Terrace. The Terrace is Jack Victory, right? Uh, I think it was. I, I read somewhere it was Doug Gilbert. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. Just uh, what I saw somewhere. Whenever I see some guy in the mask as the Russian assassin, the blackmailer, or the terrorist, I just assume it's Jack Victory. <laughs> well, he was he was in the company, so it's probably a good bet. A lot of that. Nonetheless, that's about as much as that match deserved. So, uh, the Ding Dongs, <laughs> John. Well, you know what? One quick thing about Ranger Ross, who was a legitimately, legitimate U.S. Ranger mm-hmm. against the terrorist on a military base. Like, let's incite a riot. These people are drunk enough to set building on fire or whatever. I thought that was that was kind of a risky idea. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know whoever the terrorist was, but I would have wanted to get out of there fast. But... He'll be all up on New Zealand. Up from New Zealand. The ding dongs. I don't even know where to start. This was a Jim Hurd idea. Help us out. Yeah. Oh yeah. This. Uh, you know, it. I'm sure. Lay, every, you know, go ahead, Max. Oh, I was just gonna say. I'm sure it seemed like a good idea on paper. I'm sure that when they were pitching it. In the office, you know, they probably thought, oh, you know, they're going to ring this bell and, you know, the fans are going to love them. They'll be fun for the kids. But, you know, the outfits were ridiculous. The bells were falling off everywhere. The way the gimmick was executed was even worse. And, you know, the two guys who were under the masks were a couple of guys from the uh, uh, the Georgia Indies. What were their names? It was uh, Greg Evans and Richard Sartain. They were the rock and roll yes. rebels on the uh, on the indie scene there. And yeah, that wound up pretty much being a career killer for them as far as any bigger things were concerned because they just looked horrible in the ring and any chance the gimmick had pretty much went out the window. I mean, there was just botched spot after botched spot, missed move after missed move. They looked horrible. Sean, ding dong thoughts. Maybe they were trying to sabotage themselves. See, I felt more, I felt worse for poor Cougar J and George South. At least the other two guys had masks on. The second I saw them come in, <laughs> and the first, the first thing I thought of was like, in, in looking at it in retrospect, I, when they walked in the Ding Dongs, I said, "Well, good. The the Gimp and Pulp Fiction got a tag team partner." <laughs> I, I, how can how can you put out that costume and like this is gonna be fun? I, I, I understand what you're saying, Max, but I'm trying to figure out what could have been on that paper. That made this. Your, yes. Yeah, your guess is as, is as good as mine. Otherwise, yeah, I suppose you know Jim Hurd is Jim Hurd. They figure if they you know let him have this and confine confine all the garbage to one match, maybe they can keep his hands out of some of the other things going on. Well, I will give Bob Crowley credit. He tried. He did try his hard yeah. out to get this over. I mean, here's the thing. First of all, I know they let's do it for the kids. Let's have something for everyone. To me. As soon as you say that, that's death. You can't have something for everyone because you're going to have – most of it is going to be stuff that people don't like. The ding-dongs are for the kids is what I was hearing initially. And by the way, I heard about this tag team they were doing before the show started, and I was – you know, they're going to have a tag team called the ding-dongs. I had no idea how bad it was actually going to be. Here's the thing, and I was saying this at the time. And Dave put it, in, it put it in the Observer. You roll out the Ding Dong. You give them that first shot on the Tuesday night in Des Moines, and you see how it goes there. You put it on the undercard of your house show matches. Not you know, tie it out. Not on a, nas- a nationally televised show. To me, that was the craziest part of it. Like they didn't. There was through uh oh gee the bells are falling off the costume wow surprise that that surprise should have been in des moines three minutes into this match bob I, it, it, the, um, the call was like uh, jim ross would be like and there's a hip toss and carl would go on to say and we'll be in savannah on monday like he wasn't even acknowledging <laughs> it we're just going right to the next car and just get this out of the way yeah, that that's when, when bob gives up three minutes and bob was trying the first three minutes but then he's just like okay this is out of hand so i mean i can't believe they brought him back 
Oh, uh, you know what? One, I have one phenomenal ding dong memory. I'm I'm being serious here. It was their <laughs> last match. They were up against the skyscrapers, and oh, yeah. Sid and Spivey beat the crap out of them, and they tore the mask off them. And then Norman the Lunatic put the mask on, which I thought was very funny. But I enjoyed that whole okay, here's how we're getting rid of this thing. Moving on from the ding dongs, um, to this day, I. I am very upset with the way the Midnight Express was treated by the new regime. Coming like by summer of 1988, Jimmy and the Midnights were red hot. When they finally won the tag team titles, they put them on television. These guys were ready, maybe not to main event, but. I think they could end on a clash against uh, Flair and Wyndham. I mean, you would have had to have super opponents for them, but they were over like crazy. The guys with the baby face matter. How is this possible? Well, it happened. The to make sure they cooled off that they weren't weren't going to be worth what they were paying them, and once again, they went against the uh, the SS. It was the semifinal of the tag team tournament. They had just come back. Jimmy and the Midnight had split the company for about six or seven weeks. They wanted to hit the reset button, you know, and that just didn't work out. They wound up coming back way too soon. But they're still kind of back new, freshened up a little bit here. And they're wrestling the SST, and the only reason they win is because the Road Warriors interfered. And once again, the Midnight Express uh, just is not looking at their, – their, their, it felt like they were pushing the point that they were just another tag team down our throats. Mac, general thoughts on the Midnight Express around this time period? Well, I, I agree with you that they came back too soon. You know, they left right after the New Orleans clash at the beginning of April that went against WrestleMania five. And when they left, I assumed that we'd be seeing them in the WWF very soon because, you know, the idea that you'd leave WCW be gone for less than two months and go right back, uh, just seemed impossible uh, for me to believe. I know that they did some matches in continental, not that any made TV, but I think they did some house shows, but then there they are, they're right back in WCW again. And, you know, they were a little bit fresher, but you know, them coming back didn't have the feel that it would have if it had been a year later when, uh, you know, they've been gone for a while and you could appreciate the fact that you hadn't seen them. You know, as far as them not really getting the push that they should have received or could have received, you know, just thinking about it while you were talking, I think, you know, God love him, but part of the problem was probably Jim Cornette. He's never been one uh, to suffer quietly uh, if he saw something he didn't like. And, I think he was, you know, fairly vocal about what he did and did not like with the booking and how things were run. And, you know, there's no way in a company that small and the way people talk in wrestling that that wasn't getting back to the people uh, at the, uh, you know, the CNN Tower or whatever it's called. And I think that a lot of what happened with the Midnights during 1989 and 90 was, you know, basically, you know, them trying to take it out on Jim for, you know, not going with the flow, basically. But, you know, they were a good team. They could have done more with them. And I, I'm sorry that they didn't that during that era. They should have at least had another world tag team title run. Yeah, I mean, I went to a, a benefit show in Philadelphia, November uh, 1990, and the first person I ran in was, hey, the Midnight Express quit the NWA. I'm like, like oh, you know, and then I'm, these things tend to get smoothed over after a while. I ran around Jim Cornette a lot that weekend, and and that Ole Anderson really isn't Ole Anderson's name. It was goddamn fucking Ole because he must have said that a hundred times when talking about <laughs> – and he was just beyond pissed. He'd had it and just everything. So I call goddamn fucking Ole and I tell him uh, – so Tim's a fun guy to be around. Sean, Midnight Express thoughts. Uh, I I like this team as – I like these guys' faces better with Stan, uh, when it stands on it. I just think that like – not straight – faces but like faces like Lawler used to be in Memphis where you still cheat and do all the other stuff but your baby faces because I, I just can't I mean here I like them here and I think you're right they screwed them but I, I think this team is I think the team with Lane is much better as a baby face team because I don't think Stan could ever really get into that role as a heel uh, I thought I always liked Stan as a heel I I always thought he was very funny. He came off as very cocky and arrogant. Uh, you know, he, he 
me, he always made me laugh as a heel. Um, but that's yeah, the, that's I, what I, I'm saying. I think He's, the Midnight Express. I don't think Stan likes to not be liked. And I, I, neither do I, for that matter. So, I mean, I don't know. But, I mean, Dennis likes not being liked. Yeah, I, Dennis I, was I, a great I, heel. Yeah, oh, yeah I mean, Dennis doesn't care getting stabbed and stuff like that. I think even when you're saying he's a good that Stan's a good heel, you're saying he made you laugh. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it, it was just the whole Midnight Express act that, you know, they were constantly cracking me up. And, I mean, th- Jim Cornette got over in a role that no one can get over in a baby face manager. It's just, it's darn near impossible. And Cornette had that team red hot and they just, I, I think I, to this day, I'm a little bit like, yeah, because they were so hot coming out in 1988. And then they had the road warriors destroy them. And it just wasn't the same after that. Nah. But yeah. So once again, you know, they're in the, they need help help from the road warriors to beat the SST. Speaking of which, the SST, um, a year ago, a year before this, I should say, they were in Dallas. They were feuding with Michael Hayes and Steve Do It To It Cox. Uh, they had Buddy <laughs> Roberts as their manager. And I thought they were a great team in world class. I was very happy to see them in the NWA. And I'll even go a step further. A lot of people have said over the years, Paul Pauly Dangerously wasn't a good fit for those guys. I loved Pauly Dangerously managing the SST. Max, what are your thoughts on the SST, Pauly, everything I just said? Yeah, I mean, there, it's odd that they, this is around the time that they buried the United States Tag Team title because, you know, if they weren't going World Tag Team titles for the Samoans, the U.S. title, you know, that would have been a perfect fit for them. They were, they had plenty of talent. You know, Pauly was, was great as a kind of a big mouth uh Big mouth manager, you know, those guys could go in the in the ring at that time. I don't know why they moved Samu out of the team later in the year to put Tonga Kid in as Samoan Savage. I thought Samu, you know, worked better in that duo. But um, you know, Paul was was great. I thought the way that, you know, I guess I'm I'm getting ahead of our, ourselves here, but you know, when Paul hit Cornet with the tennis racket later in the show, you know, that was like a rare bit of excellent TV production from WCW, the way they got that done, or NWA or whatever we should call them at this point. Uh, yeah, excellent point. And once again, Paul, who was actually you know totally soaked in sweat by the time that happened. Sean, thoughts on the SST, Paulie Dangerously, etc. I loved them together. I thought he was a pre- he was kind of like Lou with the Samoans, you know, a poor man's version of that. You know, that kind of outside obnoxious guy, and these just two guys who come in and kick ass. Uh, I thought, yeah. I, I, Max brings up a good point. The U.S. titles would have worked really well here. I, I haven't noted the end of this match when I was watching it, and I, I didn't remember the card, and I was taking notes for each one. And at the end of the Midnight Express, I have, Christ, they're going to put this lame-ass Freebird team over these guys. Uh, yeah. We'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> I just thought that <laughs> was, uh... You know, one thing I forgot... One thing... Lotto, drunk and barely walk, gets in the ring and security hauls him off. And Cornette gets on the mic and tells him that we're about to save your life by letting you sleep it off. I, this guy got past security uh, in the condition he was in. Crazy. And I, I, I when I saw that, that I, was a great guy, I, I thought the fa- I thought uh, Jim was just talking about the first three matches when he said, we've come here to save your life after that. <laughs> well, it works both ways. <laughs> yeah. I was like, thanks, Jim. <laughs> Well, you know, one more thing about the Samoans is it's it's real clear that, you know, they were caught in that whole trap of, you know, they were afraid to beat the Samoans, so they can't let the Midnights do it. They've got to let the LOD run in and, and basically have two teams beat them. You know, I don't think fans in a tournament setting are going to care too much about, you know, who jobs and who doesn't and, you know, think any less of a team for it. You know, they should have just put the Midnights over straight. Uh, I totally agree with you. I, you know, and you're right. In a tournament, that just does not matter. All right, another match on this show, and of course, we're running out of time quickly, more quickly than we would like to. They had Rick and Scott Steiner against Kevin Sullivan and Mike Rotundo, and I think this was the first time I looked at Scott Steiner, and I really saw something in him. And when I say something, I mean like 
potential long-term world heavyweight champion. And this is before he got that weird blonde uh, haircut, et cetera. This was, you know, very young Scott Steiner. Jim Ross was incomplete. This kid has heart mode, as he liked to do. Mm-hmm. Um uh, Max, any thoughts on young Scott Steiner? He had pretty much just it's, got there at this point. It was, I mean, I, I'd seen a little bit of him in Memphis because we got Memphis on TV here the previous year when he was up there. But, I mean, he had come a long way just in a year. And the amazing thing, one of the amazing things looking at him is just how juiced to the gills he was in 89. And, you know, we were all talking about, you know, a 10 years later how, how he looked and how juiced up he was then that, you you would have thought that you know he was walking around looking like you know 1983 Bob Backlund uh, a decade previously, but he had the the obvious talent and you know the athletic ability, and they could have worked with him on on talking. I was a little surprised that they actually let Rotundo pin him here. I'd have thought that you know they would have at least gone to a no decision or something since they were doing a match at the at the Great American Bash. Uh, you know, kind of odd booking in that sense. Here's what I think, and this is kind of me going back to what was my mindset 30 years ago. Um, As you said, I saw him in Memphis. Um, He had kind of just got, like I said, just got to WCW. At this point, he was being portrayed as, you know, hey, it's Rick's little brother, and I think that was going to be his role. That's why I was a little bit taken aback by by my own thoughts that – looked at him and I'm like, wait a minute, this guy I really seems to have something under the hood. He has good he's a good looking guy. He has a good look and he had a ton of athleticism. Sean, thoughts on young Scott Steiner. Scott Steiner d- sold more in this match than he did the last five years of his career combined. I mean was this like a true. Hazing? <laughs> very he, true. He took a beating Definitely. in this match. I for yeah, you're right about Jim Ross. He was lighting up a Barbaro after this match, but I mean, he had this massive <laughs> welt on his back. He had a massive welt on his back. He had the yeah, Sullivan like threw the chairs at him and actually hit him. Uh, the the, the, chair, the, uh, the steps yeah. and he actually hit him. I mean, this was uh, this Scott looked fantastic in this match. I mean, it, I have I I was stunned by how much he sold. Yeah, it was like a coming out party for him. You know, he was still like new and sort of humble and that wasn't going to last very long but anyway no way, way. um one thing i have i have to tell everyone about this at the 123 mark on this show go out of your way to see it there is this bizarre scott hall video where oh i was hoping you'd bring that up uh, <laughs> ah, glad i didn't disappoint because Half the video is like him wrestling a tryout match uh, at center stage in Atlanta. The other half of it is him poking alligators with sticks. <laughs> but the important part is like when he's in this match, he's doing these weird baby face gyrations, like, you know, throwing his arms around and dancing. It was, it was a bizarre sight and I encourage every, anyone to watch it. Max, your thoughts on Scott Hall is, at this point in his career. Well, you know, they're calling him Steve Gator Hall, and they're trying to push you know the whole the whole Gator thing. And you know the the crazy thing about it is you know he doesn't look like anybody that's you know out there to to hunt alligators. He's wearing jeans, he's wearing a tank top, he's got his white high tops on. <laughs> he's out there poking the alligators. It's like the beginning of a viral video, except they cut it off before the part where the Gator comes up and snaps his hand. <laughs> Sean, your thoughts on early Scott Hall? Scott Hall. Okay, so uh, this is like his highlight reel to you know put him over. They have him with an armbar. He's putting an armbar <laughs> on somebody. Oh, that's the move you're going to go for? And the other part is, as I'm watching, they have this bit where it's this long, skinny wooden bridge. And Scott's like like walking toward this alligator and a crocodile, whatever it was. And I, I, as he's doing this, there's, there's this music in the background. And I'm hearing the, the Chico, the the is a Ramon voice. Alligator, come here. Come here, alligator. He's doing <laughs> I can't do accents, but he's doing like that Razor Ramon walk as he's stalking the alligator. Yeah, it was it, it was really bad. It, 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 with him and with him and uh, Kevin Nash, you can start to see why they got bitter at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and here's the thing. Scott Hall had kind of he was uh, a big star in the AWA in like 80s. Then he went to Florida early 87. They thought they were going to 
build around him. Nope, you're not building around this guy. And he had kind of disappeared for about two years before he reappeared on this clash. I mean, I know he did some Continental, but for the most part, he was out of the business. And I have a story about Hall from his 89 run. I guess he was having a match with something with someone and something happened where he got like a, a cut on his head and he goes back to the dressing room and he's panicking because, you know, Oh my God, this is going to leave a scar. He's a pro <laughs> wrestler and he's got a little cut on his head. He's worrying about how it's going to scar. But get to the end of this show, it's Rick, Ricky Steamboat against Terry Funk, which is which was kind of a dream match coming in. I was very excited to see that. It was a really good match. Oh, by the way, before this match, uh, during the Sting Wild Bill Irwin match, Ross starts talking about how Lex Luger is upset with the top 10 ratings and he refuses to to go out and do commentary, which is kind of weird. Lex would come to the building and he'd be okay enough to come to the building, but too mad to come out and talk to people. Made no sense. I mean, the fans hated Terry Funk at this point. He was over big time as a real heel. Ricky got kind of a lukewarm reaction thanks to that, you know, family unit thing they kept talking about Lex Luger name keeps coming up during the match. Uh, we all saw what happened. You know, Luger came in, saved steamboat and, and wound up turning on him. And I thought it was one of the worst baby face moments of all time. This is why one reason why Ricky steamboat didn't get over Luger is threatening him with a chair and Ricky is on his back, begging him not to do it. Max, your thoughts. Um, there were, I mean, it, there's a lot of things, I guess, on, on my mind about the, the whole deal. I mean, um, first off, what was up with Lex's shirt? That was uh, an, an odd fashion choice in any year. But, uh, you know, well, jokes that was very aside, I mean, his look. it really was. Yeah. I mean, the, you know, Ricky, though, I agree. Like the whole family, the whole family man thing for Ricky, I mean, it could still kind of work if maybe in 89, but not really. And, They'd been doing it for months, and it was having a detrimental effect. They really needed to stop it by this point, but they just kept doubling down. Supposedly, Bonnie was behind it, but I, you know, they, somebody should have, you know, put the foot down on it. Um, I like the actual turn by Luger, and he needed to, to turn. They needed help on the heel side, and you know, they really didn't need him on the babyface side with Flair, Steamboat, and Sting over there. Um, I'm just thinking of other, you know, basic thoughts. I mean, I have to say they did a hell of a job of getting Terry Funk into that spot because, you know, a couple of years earlier in the WWF, he was just basically another guy, you know, he'd gone to Florida for a bit in 87 and, you know, wasn't there for long. And he seemed old even at that point. And somehow just by him being such a good worker and, and a believable lunatic, they managed to get him over uh, as, as one of the top heels. But yeah, you know, Luger, Ricky, you know, begging Luger for mercy didn't do much for, for, for anything. And also Terry Funk, gave Ricky a pile driver on the floor and granted there were mats and there weren't when he did it to flare on the table. But you know, if the pile driver on a table is enough to threaten Ric Flair's career, you know, Terry Funk pile driving steamboat, even on mats on a floor, you know, steamboat shouldn't have been getting up and then still doing moves afterwards. I agree. And you know, back to, you know, if you're a baby face, you're supposed to fight to the end. You're supposed to be begging some guy not to hit you with a chair. Sean, any closing thoughts on the Funk Steamboat match and everything else we've talked about? Well, the this was really – okay, but I've already gone off of my tangent about the Ricky Bonnie thing. But just one more quick thing about this is that right before the match starts, Ricky blows a kiss to her. Oh, stop, please. Why don't you just have them all come in the ring and do the bunny, the bunny hop? You know, just why don't we just bury him just a little more? <laughs> With that said, and that was obnoxious. One quick thing: he's at top. He's in the top. Didn't Rick? Okay, Terry's in the top ten ranking. Didn't Rick just give an extended speech that you haven't wrestled in three years? You can't be in the top ten. So since then, all Terry has done is jump to the champion, pile drived him on the floor after he had a match, and now he's top ten. Well, that's an interesting way uh, to, he was to, to do things. Nine. Yeah, they had. First of all, wrestling rankings never made any sense. They were always really stupid when you, when you, promotions try to realize them. And secondly, he had been on TV. Uh, he beat Eddie Guerrero. He beat Brad 
Armstrong. He beat a couple of other like guys that were semi named. So it wasn't completely outrageous that he was number nine. Um, but anyway, one last thought on the show that I wanted to share with the six wrestling audience because again, the hour always flies by. Ric Flair did an mm-hmm. interview from his home. He was sidelined. He was in the neck brace, and it was just a reminder of what a great baby face Ric Flair. Uh, was and should have continued to be. Um, I understand that he he had a lot of value as a heel, but by this point, he was way overdue to be turned, and I've always said they turned him back far too early. He was far too good a baby face to be misused as a heel the whole time. John, Uh, one uh, quick... uh, I'm sorry, I just want to make one last quick thing about the steamboat thing. Before we... Because we're sitting there riding Ricky about this, I just want to make this point clear. This was a great match. It, it this was, was a fantastic match. match. He had more oh, yeah, they, went, it was great work. No doubt about that. I went into the other room, and I could hear the chops in there. Yeah, I mean, that's how hard these guys were hitting. It. Yeah, it, it was an excellent match, and like, like I said, it was you know coming in, to me, it was like a dream match. It was being given away on free TV. Max Levy, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, this is your first wrestling podcast, right? I, I hope I, 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 it was my first wrestling podcast. I hope I did well enough to, uh, to earn an invitation back at some point. I, I, I've loved this a lot. Oh, you definitely did. And yeah, I was, you know, I was messaging you on Facebook, like, dude, come on the show. And you're like, oh, I don't use Facebook because of that. So it all worked out in the end. It all, it all worked out in the end. By the way, how could you mention Ric Flair's interview and not mention the fact that he was trolling you guys 30 years in advance with that Lakers jacket? Uh, I know he's terrible. He's, he's, a, legit Lakers fan though like uh, talking with Rick back in 88 we sat there and talked basketball for like five minutes and, uh, and then we went on to other, other subjects and of course I lost the picture um, John thank you for everything you do for the show and I w- before I sign off here comes a teaser next week we plan and we've already recorded it. We have an amazing segment that every old school WWF fan wants to hear. Uh, I'm not going to tell you what it is. You got to tune in to find out. But one of the all time great uh, myths by an, an eyewitness who was there when this happened. So I want to also want to thank Lou Kippelman, our producer. He does so much behind the scenes that you guys don't know about, but great big shout out to him. And this has been a production of the Arcadian Vanguard Podcast Network. We'll see you guys next week.